This is based on the Celtic myth of Tam Lin, um, and in this particular story, he's going to be taken forever to fairyland. Um, and the only way he, he, this can be pre prevented is if his love holds him through one long night and he's going to transform in her arms to uh, a wild boar, molten lead, but she has to not let go. Uh, and it strikes me this is a very good metaphor for marriage. Tamlin's wife. They sat us in a pale and private place, quietly conveyed the worst, explained the curse that was your fate and how for one long, ill-starred night you'd turn and burn, become all beasts you could dream up. I think that I cried out. They said that if I want to have you, then I have to hold, to hang on tight and not let go and not let go until you wake entire again within my arms, pale skin, Dark tufts of hair, long bones, in crumpled daylight. And now the sun has sunk, dark taken hold, and in my hug you jolt to sudden adder, X mark, zigzag, venom quick, then rear to brute neck dog as black as forests and spume jawed. I tell myself that you are still my love, although I'm wet with blood, and you're a lynx, filthy with fingerprints, clean pink mouth, snapping teeth near heart, my throat. I keep you caught and don't let go and don't let go and feel your skull become a bleached December sun, your eyes hot coals, you burst to blaze a wicker man, you're pouring through my fingers, molten lead. Dear husband, all those things I prize in you, your beauty, kindness, laugh, are stripped off one by one, but even with them gone, my boy stares out from stricken shapes, and love has no conditions, none. Pendle. When you must climb the hill, a woman's back bruised tender with heather, and frozen puddles of fingernails gone bad, then someone is to blame. When you must wade for miles through ragged robin, the rain knives and bog rosemary to beg arms when the neighbours owe you oats, then someone is to blame. When your children curdle like milk and turn one by one to clay dolls and your husband's fledgling weak and you're a good Christian woman, then someone is to blame. When you dream of a woman fucking goats, of men with horns, of waking the witch, swimming her, lying scalded and vice tight, then someone is to blame. When you imagine her face yoked in a bridle and you want to slit below her heart and suck there, weigh her weight against a Bible, then someone is to blame. When the Merlin steals hen chicks and your fields are blighted like a mouthful of black teeth, and your cow stark mad, then someone is to blame. This is the reworking of an old ballad uh, called The Twa Corbys, in which two ravens are discussing um, what they're going to eat that evening, and they decide to eat this night because no one cares that he's dead. Um, I've reworked it so it's now set in modern day Iraq. The Two Ravens. As I walked down a street alone, I heard two ravens make a plan. One bird unto the other said, which shall we dine on of the dead? Out there upon a dirty track, way down, a down, way down, a woman spread upon her back in the mud. Her throat cut and her body raped for bags of books, a glimpse of face. Oh, down, derry, derry, if she's bad, they're good. The bird said no one cares she lies, in dust near dogs and smears of flies. The army's led by fear and oil, the husband's had his honour spoiled. Her son stood in a hood of black, way down, a down, way down. A donkey ridden, told to crack in the blood. And other women fear to speak, which means she'll waste if not for beak. So down, derry, derry, if they're bad, she's good. So low as plains they did swoop down to chew on unveiled eyes of brown. They pecked out clumps of her dark hair to line their nests when it grew bare, and many commentators moaned way down, a down, way down, but armoured cars drove past those bones and I stood. I watched the ravens feed on war and knew I'd watch forevermore. Oh, down, derry, derry, if she's bad, we're good. 
the caravan. We were alive that evening on the North Yorkshire moors in a valley of scuffed hills and smouldering gorse. Pheasants strutted, their feathers as richly patterned as Moroccan rugs past the old Roma caravan, candles, a rose cushioned bed, etched glass that I'd hired to imagine as gypsies as our bacon and bean stew bubbled, as you built a fire, moustached, shirt sleeves rolled. It kindled and started to lick and you laughed in your muddy boots, there in the wild or as close as we can now get to the wild, skinning up a joint with dirty hands, sloshing wine into beakers, the sky turning heather with night, the moon a huge cauldron of light. The chill wind blasting away our mortgage, emails, bills, TV, our broken washing machine. Smoke and stars meant my thoughts loosened and took off like the owls that circled overhead. And I knew your hands would later catch in my hair. Hoped the wedding ring on them never seemed a snare. For if you were a traveller, I would not make you settle, but would have you follow your own weather. And if you were a hawk, I would not have you hooded, but would watch dry-mouthed as you hung above the fields. And if you were a rabbit, I would not want you tamed, but would watch you gambling through the bracken, though there is dark meat packed around your ribs, and the hawk hangs in the skies. Changeling, my new books, um, quite different from my previous stuff, which was very confessional. Um, I wanted to write about something other than myself, um, and I became very interested in, in the ballad form. That was the, the beginning of this book. Um, there's lots of updates of ballads in, in this uh, in Changeling. Um, I was particularly interested in, in the fact that ballads are a very oral form, and they were passed on orally, and each person would give them their own spin. Um, so I thought they'd be a great uh, thing to take and put my own spin on. So I've done a lot of reworkings of old ballads, um, like the Twa Corbys, um, which has become Two Ravens, uh, and like the old ballad Raina Dean about the Weir Fox, which I've um, quite radically sexed up. Um, also, I, I wanted to... Uh, my, my father passed away, um, and the, the last book was very much about that. And um, going back there, I, I, I found myself returning to the landscapes of my childhood, which my father had made very magical. He was, um, he was psychic, and he saw auras, and uh, believed in ghosts and these kind of things. Um, and uh, there's a lot of poetry in the new book that, that deals with those landscapes. Like there's a, a couple of poems about Pendle, where my father used to take me at Halloween to point out the witches. Um, and where the, seven, the 17th century Lancashire witch trials were. Um, and, and other poems about, about Lancashire, I suppose, and, and the Lancashire landscape. Um, and then through the ballads, I got excited in folklore and I started just reading loads about British folklore and mining, mining myth and thinking about the stories we, we tell about ourselves. Um, I think storytelling is very political, but it's also uh, quite cleverly, it's a way of writing political poetry without having to preach or impose a view on someone. Um, you just tell the story and they can kind of draw their own conclusions from that. 